Thank you. Good evening and greetings, my dear friends. Today <laughs> is it. Uh, it is our last session. We started this journey uh, back in August and uh, we have come to an end. I, as I was mentioning, I was at this retreat with all these clergy and telling them that uh, I've been doing theological doctrines on Thursday night since August. And they laughed and chuckled. They said, "How that? how's that been going for you? And I said, it's been going cool, great. These weirdos cool. have been joining me for two hours every <laughs> Thursday night. Uh, and, and so it's been going great for me. Uh, and I hope it's been going good for you as well. We're going to have some time at the end of our, our time together. And I want you all to kind of be reflecting a little bit on, you know, what are some of your takeaways from the from the last few months that we've been together? What's like one thing you've learned that has meant the most to you, whether it's a specific doctrine or um, uh, a piece of theology? Um, uh, I, I'm really curious to hear from you all. What's something that's been a good takeaway or something meaningful for you as we bring this to a close? So you might be thinking about that. Uh, let's begin this evening with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the beauty of this day, for the changing of seasons that remind us that nothing stays the same, that we are to always be anticipating that uh, where there is death, there is life, where there is life, there is death, where there is joy, there is sadness, where there is despair, there is hope, where there is hate, there is absolutely love. We pray this evening for your Holy Spirit to be with us, and we give you thanks for uh, the ways in which you have tied us together as a community via this uh, crazy little instrument called Zoom, and no matter where we may be, no matter what days we may have faced, I pray for your spirit this evening. In the name of Christ, amen. Um, so I... I'm, I'm, I'm entering into our conversation uh, a few different ways tonight. Uh, one is uh, I want to talk about uh, when I sat down to, to write the syllabus and schedule the dates and the topics of what I wanted to accomplish and when I wanted to accomplish, um, I specifically started with this night first and then I worked myself backwards. Um, that the last class that we would be doing is the reign of God. Um, and uh, because this coming Sunday in the liturgical year, the, the church's liturgical year, this coming Sunday is the last Sunday in the church's liturgical year. So in a week and a half or on Monday, we start a new calendar year in the life of the church. So this Sunday, the last Sunday of the liturgical year, every year, it concludes with Christ the King Sunday, or the Reign of Christ Sunday. And I want to share with you, um, uh, because I, I don't know that I'll talk about it this much on Sunday, but let me share with you that that Christ the King Sunday isn't something that's been there for 2,000 years, hasn't been there since uh, we started celebrating Christmas and Easter. This was instituted just shy of 100 years ago uh, in 1925, and I've included this um, citation from Frank Sen. Uh, Pope Pius XI established Christ the King Sunday in 1925 to counter what he regarded as the destructive forces of the modern world, secularism in the West and the rise of communism in Russia and fascism in Italy, Spain, harbingers of the Nazi soon to seize Germany. Pope Pius intended to oppose the rule of Christ to the totalitarian claims of these ideologies. And so the idea was that in these fascist regimes, um, that they were co-opting or corrupting the, the, the rule of Christ uh, and using it as a, weaponizing it as a means for oppression over the people they governed. 
And uh, one of the other statements that we've talked about before that has come out through, you know, essentially this period was the theological doc, uh, declaration of Barman. Now this came later than 19, 1925, but this is Pope Pius uh, in, in 1925 saying, what these people are doing in the name of Christ is wrong. And um, the, the greatest of the articles that I've, that I've seen is this one I highlighted from simplycatholic.com. So when you have time later, um, take a moment and read that maybe before Sunday. Uh, so you have an idea of why we do what we do. The other citation I have there is from uh, the Presbyterian Mission uh, org is from the denomination talking a little bit more about Christ the King Sunday. Um, I don't know. I mean, this is something that's new to me. I have learned this this year. This isn't something I've known um, uh, because it's been this way ever since I've been born. So I didn't realize that this was the, the last in the flow of uh, liturgical uh, high holy days. That being said, uh, you know, it has is, it is changed my approach is that Christ the King Sunday has always been my focal point, the theological focal point of Christ the King Sunday has always been what we're going to talk about tonight. What's new for me is what a declaration it is against fascism, against totalitarianism. And uh, that, uh, at, and and this is going to sound flippant. Just just go with it. Uh, what a colleague said: This is truly uh, the church's Antifa day, right? This is anti-fascism day, Antifa. Uh, this is this is truly the Christian church saying no to uh, to fascism. And and I've wow. never considered it from that political lens before and remember political is not the same as partisan um 90 of what jesus talked about is political uh not partisan and so this truly is a declaration to the world every every year when we observe this this day it is truly meant to be a declaration to the world to stand apart from or to turn away from all of those forces of man, all of the mechanisms and channels of humanity that would either A, wield religion against us, or B, drive us away from religion, religion or C, uh, 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 utilize tools such as capitalism and other forms of ideology or idolatry uh, to co-op corrupt or distort Christianity and that is something that I've been pondering about that is a new a new filter for me to consider and think about and I might say something a little bit more about that on Sunday but um, uh, as I said when I started the syllabus and scheduling this is the end that I had in mind um, uh, and and I'm, I'm I'm glad we're here John did you want to add something I would. I, I I agree with you, Josh. I mean, I, uh, I. I mean, I'm just reading this for this the first time. But I mean, I. You know, I've studied European history and political movements and stuff for you know 30 years, uh, in depth. And I mean, 1925 is not an insignificant year that this happened. It didn't happen by accident. I mean, the you know the last piece of that fascist puzzle sort of fell into place when, you know, Hitler and the brown shirts uh, were, you know, conducted the beer hall push in November in 23. So, you know, this is about a year after that or so. Um, and, you know, you already had, like you said, Mussolini in Italy, uh, very close to home to the Pope, uh, you Stalin. know, literally right down the street. Uh, mm -hmm. You had Franco in, in Spain. Uh, you also had a lot of stuff going on in Greece and, you know, just like in Russia with the, the Orthodox, you know, strain of, of Catholicism. Um, I mean, it was the, the Pope had to have been feeling that he was being surrounded, basically. Um, you know, and, and there was a, a couple of years, you know, before the Nazis really 
came back into into power. I mean, there was a couple of prison years intervening there, but um, you know, it, it, it makes a lot of sense that the Pope would would do something like this. I would caution, though, just a word uh, that if you mention this in the pulpit on Sunday, I would not say that this is the church's Antifa moment. <laughs> no, Those, no. I, I, I qualified it. And Look, you can go to the tape. We're recording. I qualify. I said a colleague referred to I, it as. I know. I wouldn't even. <laughs> I wouldn't even put that on a colleague. There's a lot. There's a lot better. But I mean, uh, you know, in in a, in a no, John. Way, you're, no, I have no plans on calling it Antifa Day. <laughs> yeah, the, the church is Antifa Day. Um, but I mean, if you want to put it in current perspective, and you know, partisan versus political. Just look at recent political things that have involved, you know, a beer hall push kind of thing, like, you know, January 6th, what happened in D.C., not making partisan statements, just looking at activities that have gone on and, you know, uh, clearing out protesters in Washington, walking to the front of a church with an upside down Bible. So, I mean, you know, but but extend that out into a continent wide movement yeah. where you had all kinds of bad and it's not new bad things being done in the name of religion but you know this is also on the heels of a generationally you know uh negating world war you know less less than five years basically after the end of that so yeah. it's it's not insignificant no you're right uh, and thank you for sharing all that john i appreciate that um but I I, uh, I, I I don't know, um, like I said, I have never thought about it in those terms before. And, and truly that's what he instituted when he did in those terms. Uh, what I have been thinking is, um, you know, this is 2021, we're only a handful, you're only four years away from this being the 100th uh, anniversary of Christ the King Sunday, and that will also be Hope's 50th anniversary that year, and um, and I'm wondering how that, at least as your pastor, I'm wondering about how that doesn't incorporate into some of our vision uh, of how we continue to go over, uh, to grow over the next several years, and that this doesn't become a little bit more elevated in the life of our church, um, not all, uh, not all, uh, uh, not all Christian churches elevate this. Uh, Catholics, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, Disciples of Christ, uh, Churches of Christ um, uh, do uh, uh, lift this up, but not all um, non-denominational. And honestly, uh, Jim Henry, I'd be happy for you to share with me. I. Was this a Sunday? This is, I don't know whether this was ever lifted up in the Baptist tradition. Not in my church. I, I don't know in the whole or the whole of Baptist, but I was not aware of it. Yeah. You know, when I was growing up. Yeah. No. That I I, do, I wouldn't expect many Baptists um, um, to to elevate this Sunday as a, a high holy day um, in, in the life of the church. So um, anyway, I, I wanted to lead off with that. Uh, let me encourage you to read that Simply Catholic article, because uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a good reference. Um, the reign of God, the end towards which we move. Let's do some scripture reading. Now, uh, what I'm going to ask is, I've got four passages here. I know how much John loves reading the fourth passage, so I will ask John to read the fourth passage. Um, but can I get some... Uh, uh, volunteers to read one to read first corinthians one to read revelation 21 one to read ecclesiastes uh gloria and jim and then one of the denzins Gloria, do you want to do 1 Corinthians? Yes. All right, 1 Corinthians, go for it. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. Wow. 
Yeah. So uh, the idea of part of what Paul's talking about, and <clears throat> this is a, a, a favored passage read at many weddings. It was read at my wedding. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what I what I would have you take away with regard to this passage is the idea of uh, that all things are not complete in the present. Paul yeah. saying all things will be complete at a time unknown to you that, but until that time comes, what Paul's saying is you're going to be able to see glimpses of that, the the eternal reign. You're going to get to see glimpses of that along the way. And if any of y'all have been listening to me for years, uh, be on the lookout for it. Be on the hunt for it because you're going to get to see uh, 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 foreshadowing some some glimpses of the eternal reign of God or the kingdom of God. Um, uh, Who who wants to take on the beast of uh, Revelation 28? Revelation 21, 1 through 8. John, let me let me pause you there. So uh, this is written by John the Revelator. Um, uh, uh, he's writing on an island of Patmos. Um, I don't know if Patmos had peyote, uh, but certainly there is a lot of stuff in the book of Revelation to make me feel like there might have been some peyote uh, on the Isle of Patmos or some really funky mushrooms. But, uh, but it is important because uh, while this seems so bizarre and coded and, 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 and weird, um, he's dropping some serious foreshadowing, some, some serious uh, messages of hope for the world to hang on to. And uh, 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 very important for us to, to embrace and to receive and not to be turned away because it's weird. All right, Don. He, he may have been stuck in a cave with 50 cats. <laughs> just saying. It's, it's possible. It's possible. <laughs> then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, out of heaven, from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, the fornicators, the sorcerers, the idolaters and the liars, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Well, isn't that lovely? Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, uh, It's very poetic. What did you say? It's very poetic. Yeah. John? That, That one wasn't read at your wedding this well, was not right? read at my okay. wedding uh no no uh but but we're we're what john is writing the revelator is proclaiming here is uh is again uh the way the world is right now is not how it's going to be uh when when all is said and done and you need to hold on to that and There's going to be a new heaven and there's going to be a a new earth because the first heaven and first earth will have passed away, right? And there will be a new holy Jerusalem and 
And, and what are some of these promises? Well, in that time to come, God will dwell with them. They will be his peoples. God himself will be with them. And what's, I think, beautiful is he will wipe every tear from their eye. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. The idea of, see, I'm making all things new. I think in the depths of the grief and depression that I have experienced in my life, it is part of what helps pull me through that is because I hold on tight to these promises that there is something new that is on the horizon. And maybe like Paul, all I can do is see it dimly at this moment, but I, I can believe my faith tells me that there is this other side of this. Uh, let's go on to this number six, verse six. Uh, uh, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. You know, in what way, well, first off, uh, what does that mean, alpha and omega? Anybody? They, they, they oh, Diane. I was going to say, I'm thinking it was, I would say it's forever. It's beginning and eternity, uh, infinite. But why those descriptors? Why Alpha, why Omega? What does that mean? Well, that's the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. There it is. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll see that uh, symbology in churches. Uh, the, the stole that I wear at funerals is the Alpha Omega. Um, the stole, the, the paramounts that we put off of the, the pulpit and the font is the, I mean, the pulpit and the lectern is the Alpha Omega. And uh and again, this idea, what I think is important is there is God is the beginning, God is the end. And, and when I'm going through whatever it is I'm going through there in the middle, I'm in the middle. It isn't the end. Um, there was this fiction quote, and I can't remember from where it comes from, maybe the Grand Marigold Hotel, I want to say. And it was, uh, in the end, all things will be well. And if all things aren't well, then it isn't the end. <laughs> Hold on to that. That's what John is saying here. Uh, and this promise. And, and I wish we would all tattoo this on ourselves. I will be their God and they will be my children. I am yours and you are mine. That is what we should be repeating as an echo. That should be the closing of every prayer. I am yours and you are mine. I am yours, God, and you are mine. And to John and the prayer, to the people around me in the pews, I am yours and you are mine. Um, these are the words that, yes, while we might not read verse 8 at our wedding, uh, verse 7 works. Um, uh, I will be their God and they will be my children. I am yours and you are mine. Uh, J Jim Henry, you want to do Ecclesiastes 2. Well, Ecclesiastes 2, 24 through 26. Let me there preface this by saying, uh, sorry, John, let me preface this by saying that, Jim, that Ecclesiastes chapter 2 is by far one of my most favorite chapters in the whole 66 books. Now, Matthew 25, it's great, but uh, Ecclesiastes 2, for probably the better part of a decade, has been my favorite chapter in almost the whole of, uh, of Scripture. But, all right, Jim, let's do it. Okay, Ecclesiastes 2, 24 through 26. There is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he gives the work of gathering and heaping, only to give to one who pleases God. This, is, this also is vanity and a chasing after wind. That's probably oh, another yeah. tattoo I should add. Uh, this is uh, vanity and chasing after the wind. What does that mean, 
Uh, and how does this tie into this idea of the reign of God? What does the idea of vanity and chasing after the wind and what he's saying here, and how does that tie into the reign of God? Kind of like tilting at windmills. Tell me more about that, Jim. Well, I'm thinking of Don Quixote as trying to conquer something that he can't conquer. Mm -hmm. uh, tilting at windmills, chasing the wind. You can't catch the wind. You can't beat a windmill. You're trying to, your whole life is spent on trying to conquer something that you can't conquer. And yeah, what is, and, and aside from conquering, Jim, right? Aside from conquering, what is it that uh, God would say, uh, God would have you do? Just trust in him. Uh, <laughs> don't be apart from him. Don't, I, I don't know a better way to say it than just trust in him and believe in him and don't, don't fight it. You know, don't chase after windmills, chase after me. Yeah, oh, that's pretty. Yeah, I, I, I mean, in that first, go ahead, Diane. Is it kind of like saying don't become a part of the world and chase after worldly things, chase after spiritually things, spiritual things? Uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, but of course, I'm going to ask you why, <laughs> why, uh, well, what is it God wants us to follow him not follow idols which are the things that so many things in our world back then and today both can become idols you know objects technology money sure. uh, lifestyle all of that i can accept that thank you diane john did you want to say something yeah, I, I associate these ideas of vanity and chasing after the wind as selfish things. And, you know, the, the, don't do them. You know, they, to, to do that is to be, to be vain and to, to chase after ethereal things like the wind is, are selfish pursuits. Whereas he would rather have you do, like we're going to learn about in Matthew 25, serve others. Yeah, well, uh, and I like the word you used, uh, you said the word ethereal, and uh, part of my takeaway from this, you just go back to verse 24, the, the writer lays it out, there's nothing better for mortals than to eat, than to drink, and to find enjoyment in their toil, and this gives me great pleasure being with y'all, that gives me great pleasure hanging out with y'all every Thursday night for the last couple of months. And I have promised you that I have definitely, I'm drinking wine now. Um, I have enjoyed uh, that. Uh, and why is that, right? Well, you got to eat, you got to drink. And baby, if you got to work, man, enjoy what you do. Um, because, and, and I think this is what's important is it's temporary. And that's the thing about vanity and chasing after the wind. Is this not eternal? And in the context of the reign of God, we're talking about stuff that's eternal, right? So in chapter two, part of what he writes about is, is, you know, I thought that I should be the richest man in the world. So I amassed all of these riches and this wealth and I had the biggest castles and the fanciest robes and the, the most donkeys and the most camels. And at and, and the end of the day, I came to realize that when I die, I die the same way as a poor man. And so then I thought, well, that's a vanity and chasing after the wind. And so then he says, you know what? I think I need to be the smartest guy in the room. So I amassed all of this wisdom and this knowledge and, and I could do things, you know, mentally. But then I realized that when I die, I die the same as anybody else. And all of that has been a vanity and chasing after the wind. And, and in the pursuit of all those things, he wasn't happy. It wasn't joy there. It was a, it was a now, I mean, you used the word selfish. It was a, a very now centered thinking versus uh, uh, enjoying the gift of the life 
between the alpha and the omega for one thing, but also keeping our heart, our mind, and our thoughts on the eternal. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, uh, I mean, other ways that people would say that is life's too short to sweat the small stuff, right? You know, enjoy what you eat, enjoy what you drink, and find great joy and the work that God has called you to. And what is that work that God has called us to? John, why don't you read old Matthew 25 for us? Yes, sir. I could almost do this from memory by now. We're um, all getting better at it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I love that the more, the more I read this, the more I really like this opening, you know, verse 31, you know. Go for it. Um, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then he will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited? you and the king will answer them truly i tell you just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family you did it to me thank you john uh, so within this passage I, I think the the two parts again thinking about the reign of god that, that i'd have us hone in on is yes uh verse 31 uh when the son of man comes in his glory first off it's not if, it's when, uh, that there will, be, there will be a time when the Son of Man returns back, that when Jesus returns back in all glory and angels with him. And at that moment, and again, thinking Christ the King Sunday, uh, that in that moment that, uh, that Jesus will be upon a throne of glory, that will then be institute the reality of now and forever um, that there will be a redemption of this world uh, far beyond what we can imagine. And in that coming, there will be those who are invited to inherit that. And verse 34, uh, come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, what I think is important about this is again, and this is going to get us into the next bullet point here, and ties back to the uh, Revelation passage, can't underscore enough the idea of Alpha and the Omega, that God, and if we go all the way back to the beginning of our time together, and, and looking at, uh, in the beginning, God, right? Remember the first four words of the Bible, in the beginning, God? If we go all the way back, that before time and space, God has this vision of how all this is going to play out. That is something for which we should have as a tenant of what we believe. There is not a, uh, 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 whoops, well, we'll just see how it turns out. God has an idea. Now, all the, now let's look down there at the timeline that I gave you there, right? The big picture, all of the, 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 the details and the marks of time all the way through, okay, they play out the way they play out. Uh, we, we know that, uh, that uh, in, in the passage that I'm reading for this Sunday, Mark 13, hey, there's going to be war, or the one I read from last weekend, there's going to be wars. There's going to be fighting. There's going to be hardship. There's going to be poverty. There's going to be all the things that you can anticipate as a result of sin and and, and, and the brokenness of the world, but for one, it, as the alpha, it absolutely isn't the way in which our sovereign 
God had established it or intended for it to be, and as the Omega, right, regardless of all of the hiccups in time, that in the end, it will be the way that God intends it to be. Uh, John. So I think that's part of why I like that verse 31, because that portends Omega, you know, you know, it, on this, this timeline. Yeah. And, but that sort of cuts against what you said earlier about if it, if something didn't end well, don't worry, it's not the ending. Because that, the, the implication of that is that everything will end well, unless you're a goat, and then it's not going to end well. <laughs> you know? Well, Tom so, Brady's a goat. Uh, 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 well, I'm just saying, he's the greatest of all time. Uh, to see, I wore my goat hat for that reason. No, uh, well, John, and I didn't include that portion of the passage. Um, and, and you may note that, that I didn't talk about the other portion of that. Um, uh, we've covered judgment and uh, salvation in earlier classes, and I didn't want us to get into uh, rehashing some of that tonight. I want us to stay focused on, you know, if all, if all in the end, all things will be well, and if all things aren't well, then it isn't the end. Um, uh, and, and holding on and holding fast to the promise that that it will be the way God intends for it to be. That is a promise. That will come to be. And I can believe that. Um, now, uh, in the Hebrew scriptures, while the kingdom of God isn't explicitly mentioned in the Old Testament, there is a prevailing idea that God rules and reigns over the people of Israel. God is Lord, Isaiah. For the Lord is our judge, and the Lord is our ruler, the Lord is our king, and he will save us. Okay, There is this idea that there uh yes there there is the sovereignty of god we've talked about that earlier on that um this is the the ruler of all time and space and if we're using the word ruler the sovereignty the lord then we're implying that there is a a governor over all of this that it isn't just you know let's throw a bunch of ingredients in the pot and see what comes out there is a master chef, so to speak. Does that make sense? Great. Um, in time, people did anticipate an actual kingdom on earth. And this is the problem that we see leading up to and including the time of Jesus. So much of what Jesus was talking about was talking about the Omega, right? The, the time of the new Jerusalem. But what was it that the people were hearing and had been uh, expecting? Well, when Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem Palm Sunday. on Palm Sunday. They're expecting this to be the inaugural moment of the establishment of the Davidic line of King David, now King Jesus, and not King Jesus in the Alpha and the Omega King Jesus, but King Jesus as in we're pushing out the Roman-controlled uh, empire, and not only are we establishing the kingdom, and God will do what God does, and there's going to be a, 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 a king, an earthly kingdom, um, but we are going to be our own independent nation and territory and land and economy and et cetera. So there's a disconnect in what Jesus is teaching and what the people are anticipating. And to be fair, in the Hebrew scriptures, they're anticipating this for hundreds of years. The prophecies, the prophets have been talking about this for hundreds of years 500 years they've been anticipating and waiting the arrival of the messiah for the for the continuation of the lineage of david um and uh, uh what god does is something very different from that and the scriptures the kingdom of god is a central theme throughout matthew mark and luke uh jesus teachings uh maintained the continuity of the hebrew scriptures yes all those prophecies were talking about the the establishment of the reign of christ the reign of a, a of god of king jesus just not in the way in which you were anticipating um and and that's what we began to see played out in the gospels and the christian scriptures and there's a few things that we can uh, take away and begin to own, accept, embrace as what God's reign is biblically. God's reign is 
dynamic. God's reign over all things is visible and visible. But more importantly, the kingdom of God is people who acknowledge God's reign. So this is the kingdom of God is something that is not territorial geographically. The kingdom of God is something that exists spiritually or uh, you know ethereally this is something that exists uh beyond time and space uh, beyond land this is something that exists um spiritually does that is that is that tracking that it, and that's what makes this different from what they may have been anticipating god's reign is universal jesus taught that God's reign is over all and it transcends all national affiliations. The idea of being within the kingdom of God or the body of Christ is something that knows no borders. It knows no boundaries. How much have you heard me say, if John Calvin uh, were to pop into Hope Presbyterian Church this Sunday, I'm talking about a, a 500 year old dead dude, uh, from Europe popping in and still within the kingdom of God, within the people that he's gathered around, right? So it is universal in that sense. It's unlike, say, for example, the, uh, the Roman Empire, which was geographical. It had a begin date and an end date. That is not what uh, and, and didn't reach out beyond the bounds of, of the empire that it controlled. And it was built by human hands. That's not what's going on with the idea of the reign of God. God's reign is connected to the person Jesus. Um, Jesus self-identified as the coming son of man, which is synonymous with the coming kingdom of God. Ultimately, through Jesus, God's cause will win. Both God's cause won in the death and resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, and God's cause continues to win and will win supremely in the end when Jesus returns, okay? So uh, the, the whole idea of the kingdom of God is centered solely around uh, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, God's incarnational uh, uh, encounter with humanity as fully human. Uh, God's reign is imminent and demands a response. Jesus declares an already aspect to the establishment of the kingdom. Uh, Matthew 12, but if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Well, does Jesus cast out demons? Yup, absolutely. There you know now the kingdom of God has come to you, Luke 11. But if by this finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you, Mark 1, and saying the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe in the good news. This is, this is now, right? And, and this is where we get, we're going to get into a little bit more about why some are so much more uh, urgently driven by the the time is now, um, but the, the idea is there is, there's nothing to wait for. There's nothing more, to, there's no more results to, 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 to come. The imminence of it is it's here. And now is the time for you to respond. Uh, you know, you know, we, as the unbeliever don't have to go through two and a half months of doctrinal study on Thursday night with Pastor Josh. It's as simple as Christ has come. God loves you. The reign of God exists through Jesus the Christ. And you've been invited. Come on in. Will you come in? That's the idea with regard to that. Entrance into the kingdom is by faith. Now, you've been given the invitation. Will you accept it? Which entails an entire new life marked by love and servanthood. Uh, uh, Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does by the will of the Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? And then I will declare to them, 
I never knew you go away from me, you evildoers. It'll also include the second half of Matthew 25 versus Rulo, you know, the, the goats who didn't feed, didn't give drink, didn't welcome, uh, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, visit the sick and the imprisoned. Mark 12, Jesus answered. The first is, hear Israel, the Lord your God. Uh, the Lord our God is the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and all your strength. Mark 10, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. Uh, this is the idea that, that when we accept the invitation, that there is to be a new way of life, that there is to be a way of life that, as we talked about uh, a few weeks ago, that is marked by love, that is marked in service to others. And the, the focal point that our church has galvanized around over the last two years is that Matthew 25 passage uh, that John read earlier. So before I get into the Christian tradition, any questions? Great. So Ed Daisy, unmute yourself because I'm going to ask you a question. Go ahead. When is he coming back, Ed? No one knows but the father. <laughs> well, there's so you want to ask me, you. Josh. What's that, John? I thought you would ask me because that's my favorite bumper sticker of all time. All right, John. When's he coming back? I don't know, but boy, is he pissed. <laughs> <laughs> oh man that gets me every time uh and i forget every time and you get me with it every time that's great um uh, yeah uh no one knows but the father i am absolutely no matter what else i'm about to talk about i am absolutely okay with that no one knows but the father there are in the greek language there are two words that are uh, in English, we have one word for the word time. But in Greek, there are two words for time. Okay. Um, there is chronos and kairos. Chronos is time as the way of you know, all right, Josh, let's get this class going. You've got a schedule to keep and let's not keep everybody so late tonight. Or, you know, the next class I will teach in January is blah, blah, blah. There's the chronos. From the word chronos, we get chronological, right? This is the timeline, time. Kairos time is God's time. This is something that isn't measurable, but uh, it can be um and honestly uh, I, I feel very serious when i say that the two hours every thursday night that we have spent together for the last two and a half months is chrono is kairos time right that god has set apart something for us and and pulled together the certain group of people for us to be together and to live in this space that will not exist again this is Kairos time, okay? It's not bound by a beginning, uh, by, you know, uh, the, the timeline of things. There is a timeline. We've met August 29th at 7, 7 p.m., uh, et cetera. There is that. But the work that we've done, the, the, what's been built here is a Kairos time. And what happens to us in the Christian tradition over the 2,000 plus years since his ascension is trying to figure out the chronos time when is he coming back and the what i'm going to tell you is part of the challenge of that part of if we get lost in the details of the chronos time the chronological time the when then we minimize the 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 things that are happening in the kairos time the does that make sense right, that we can be so focused on the chronos time, the chronological, that we totally miss out on God's kairos, the movement of God that's happening in the meantime, and this is where we run into some issues, so in Revelation chapter 20, uh, John, the, uh, John the Revelator writes, 
uh, again, don't forget, there must have been some cat poo on that cave or some peyote on the island or some funky mushrooms. John writes, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. That hone in on it, a thousand years. And threw him into the pit and locked and sealed it over him so that he would deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be let out for a little while. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, in order to gather them for battle. They are numerous as the sands of the sea. <laughs> If Phoenix ever comes home talking about Gog and Magog and the dragon, I'm going to be going to Walgreens and getting a drug kit. Well, um, it, it, even if he sits down with a calendar and starts trying to figure out when a thousand years is up. <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, I'm going to have some issues with my son if that's the case. So a thousand years, this becomes uh, a central point of focus for Christians try throughout all of this time since Jesus ascended or since John of Patmos wrote this of trying to figure out the, the when Jesus is coming back. And um, this is predominantly a much larger issue in non-reformed Protestant churches such as Baptist and non-denominational. So Jim, I might just pick on you a little bit here and it's fine. You're also completely welcome to say what you've heard from the pulpit growing up, okay? You're talking about when the end of times is? Yeah, yeah. all of that, all of that. And Ed, I know you've been waiting two and a half months for us to get to this portion of the outline. And here we are, baby, we have arrived. Um, so there's several schools of thought when it comes to this idea of the thousand years. So the idea is that Christ will reign for a thousand years. And then after Christ reigns for a thousand years, all hell's going to break loose for a little while. And then Christ reigns supreme forever. So one school of thought is premillennialism. Jesus Christ will physically return before the end of the thousand-year reign. The idea holds that when Christ comes, uh, McKim writes, the Antichrist figure will be judged and the righteous will be resurrected at Christ's second coming. Satan will be bound and peace will reign on earth. At the end of the millennium, Satan is freed for a short period gathers nations into rebellion against Christ, but is vanquished by fire from heaven. In short, Christ's return is imminent at any moment. Now, how many ways have we seen evangelists and uh, God-fearing pre uh, preachers proclaim that this is it? Look at the signs. Let me read it. Let me tell you what I'm seeing here in the tea leaves. You know, that war in the Gulf in 1990, they're saying back in 1990, this is it. This is the end of times. It wasn't. And they say, oh, well, you know, the, the, the terrorist attack of 9-11, this is it. This is the sign. This is, the, this is what's going to happen. This is the indicator that Satan's run amok in the world and Christ will return any minute. And we're still here. And uh, the Afghanistan war. So this has been used as uh, a way to explain the intangible or the 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 undesirable aspects of human history i know that absolutely in world war one and, and then again in world war ii this would have felt like the end of times the dropping of the bomb in japan felt like 
the end of times. The Cold War of the 80s felt like the anticipation of the end of times. And yet, Kronos time keeps ticking. Jesus has not yet returned. Kairos time is still in flux, is still at loose here. Any questions on that? This is going to get a little weird. It's, it's a little complicated. You uh, ask about the, the Baptist, and if, you know, from what I remember, the, we didn't really talk about a specific time. The whole emphasis was it could be in 10 seconds. It could, be, it could be at any time. So prepare yourself. Now, That's right. when we were talking, a lot of the things about the, the thousand year reigns and the devil and people and, you know, chaos and hell on earth. And that was part of it. That was part of the any second now, boys. So y'all better be prepared so that you're on the right side of the right side of the, the line that's drawn in the sand when the time comes. There you go. Premillennialism. Absolutely. So let's but talk. What happens until we see peace and security, and we haven't seen that yet. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that's the segue into postmillennialism. Jesus will physically return after a period of Christ's special reign on earth for a thousand years. Well, as you said, have we had that yet? No, no. Uh, 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 I'm not sure that John's bumper sticker fits into a post-millennialism idea. Jesus coming back and boy, is he pissed, right? That doesn't fit within this category. The idea of post-millennialism holds that, as McKim writes, the spread of the gospel throughout the earth, bringing people to faith in Christ will give a flight to evil and the Antichrist, either a little person, literal person or a figurative symbol, and then the millennium arrives. Satan is bound for this period, so evil is thwarted. After the millennium, Satan then is loose, rebel, rebels, and comes into final conflict with the religious. Jesus triumphantly returns and banishes Satan at that point. But to get there, can you wrap your head and mind around the idea of a world worldwide reign of peace. Um, why does the reign have to include peace? So I, when I when I look at that, the, the thousand year reign. I mean, you could interpret that a bunch of different ways. Peace is one of them. You could also interpret it that you know, the day of the resurrection or the ascension would then start that thousand year clock ticking, you know, because that was the beginning of Christianity. You're you know, right. when, when Christ went back up, sat on the right hand side of God, and that began the thousand year reign. And there are That's absolutely what, some who would hold that, John. Well, but then you could also view it as sort of a rolling conditional thing where, you got to put together a thousand good years. <laughs> you know, so you could go for 999 years and then screw something up, a world war or, you know, something like that. And that resets the clock. But the description of, you know, the lion will lie down with the lamb and all the peaceful things that happen then, you know, seem to be describing the thousand year reign of Christ. That's right. Yeah. John, we're not there. We've never been there. Uh, it has not happened. Um, uh, I, I love the idea of uh, one all poop wipes out 99 attaboys. Um, uh, and that's, what I, that's a theology that I, uh, I've never heard before when it comes to Christ. Uh, but no, I think, I think what Ed's saying is it, when we look at the prophecies, when we look at the things in which Jesus describes, uh, none of it has ever come to be. Uh, uh, we, uh, human history hasn't observed it yet. And yet, uh, part what some have argued is exactly what you said, John, is that the clock started ticking on the ascension of Jesus or the birth of Jesus and, and the clock started ticking. And many would argue that we're living in the unbound, uh, hell on earth, Satan's, you know, wild rumspringa all throughout the world. Uh, we're living in it right now. 
is what some would say, and that in the post-millennialism, uh, as we've been living in hell in the reign of Satan for all this time period, that Christ would, it, it, the next step would be the return of Christ. Um, uh, in short, this, this idea is that our involvement in the world is central because part of the work that we have to do is to spread the gospel and live out in short, Matthew 25, that not only are we spreading the gospel and bringing others the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, but we are radically living into Matthew 25, because that's exactly what Jesus said. This isn't the judgment of John. It isn't the judgment of Hillary. It isn't the judgment of Jeannie. What is it that Jesus says in Matthew 25? This is the judgment of the nations. All the nations of the world will be held to this standard. Um, and uh, we must be active in carrying out this mission socially, culturally, in preparation for the thousand year reign. Um, so then there is a millennialism. Uh, and usually when there is an A preceding uh, a term, it means not millennialism, right? It means the uh, amoral. Uh, someone without morals. Uh, this view, uh, this uh, this views the thousand year reign figuratively, uh, not literally, right? So the idea is not within the the Greek chronos. Um, it could refer to the eternity of the church's life. McKim writes during the time between. Christ's first advent in Bethlehem and his final advent in power and glory, which is what we're about to enter into, the season of advent, the time in which we are preparing ourselves for the second, ad we, are in, we, are li we live in the second advent, and the season of advent that we're entering into in a week is, is when we get into the season of advent, our preparation, our heart is not to be focused on the, the coming of Jesus the first time that he came because it was already come. We recognize that. We celebrate that. But the season of Advent is a time for our hearts and minds and souls to be preparing for Christ coming again. And so um, uh, in, in his final Advent and power and glory, the forces of good and evil have struggled through history. The church may anticipate an intensity of persecution contending always with the spirit of Antichrist as well as those persons who seem particularly to embody evil. When Christ returns in glory, the fullness of his redemptive work will be completed. In short, it's a hybrid of the pre and the post millennialism. It's, it's little less, it's not as much about a specific chronological time of when. Uh, but the, the, the work that we're doing in prepping the conditions um, and, 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 and to, to a point in which we have prepared sufficiently for the return of, of Jesus. Okay. So, Josh, just, just for giggles, while you were talking, I Googled what happened in 1000 AD. Okay. Just to see what might happen after that thousand years when satan is unloosed un, or loosened and <laughs> one of the things was it said that leif erickson was the first person to land in the new world in a thousand a.d okay so how do you interpret that john I, I i mean cynically i would say that that may have been the unloosing of satan <laughs> well the native americans sure thought so uh, <laughs> uh right. but but the 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 challenge i put back at you is wow what a western centric um narcissistic thought that could be um uh, what about china what about africa what about australia what about you know all all of the other areas of the world um uh, you know yeah, that, that's such a Western centric idea. Um, but I mean, I, and I get it because I live it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm prone to it myself. Um, uh, but that same question, the same thing you did is exactly 
all the buildup and hype leading up to 2000, the turning from 1999 into 2000. We all lived it. We all know there was lots of folks, right? Suicides increased, right? What happened with uh, Herf Applewhite? Anybody remember Herf Applewhite? This is the guy who uh, 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 was a cult leader, and uh, he was uh, he was preparing for uh, Jesus was coming, riding Haley's comet, and so uh, the way in which you get on Haley's comet is you drink the special juice and you die, and you ascend up spiritually to the Haley's comet, and then there's aliens and. I don't know. It, it was in the late 90s. You remember that? Uh, right. Yeah. Fun fact, it was 1996. Fun fact, he was a graduate. Uh, he was a Presbyterian minister's son. He went to seminary, Presbyterian seminary, and he was a graduate of Austin College, which is my alma mater. Uh, so I have the same, <laughs> I have the same qualifications as Herb Applewhite. I'm leading y'all to Haley Bob. Um, uh, y'all had Herb Applewhite. We had uh, Robert so Robert who? E. Lee. Oh, well, uh, I, I, yeah. I'm not going to make any comment on either of them. Well, uh, then there's always the, uh, you know, the best one hit wonder song of all times. Go for it. Zager and Evans in the year 2525. It takes us all the way up to the year 10,000. If you remember the lyrics, part of it is, I, I think it was in the year 8,500. If God's going to come, he ought to be here by then. And he's going to look around. I, I can't remember. Later. He's going to look around and say, I'm either pleased where a man has been or tear it down and start all over again. Jim Henry, I have no idea what you're talking about. I really look forward to hearing what you're talking about. So Do you, put, no, no, I, I'm just, we're talking about trying to figure out when the end of time is. Yeah, I, I'm talking song. about the song. I've never heard the song You've before. You've never heard the song in the year 2525, if man is still alive. No, sir. Uh, but Just uh, Google it and look at it. I mean, it, it goes through 10,000 years and... Uh, you know, well, it's... I'll put it in the, the lineup for this Sunday. Uh, uh, <laughs> In short, that's just another that's just another prognostication that man is going to be around. Well, how many times years. have we had prognosticate prognosticate a lot, a lot, and, and, and how many times was, have they failed? Every that's time, it was a, that's why it was a one hit wonder, and they never had another hit song. There it is. So important from McKim, he writes, though the kingdom is not ours to win, but God's to give. God works through human efforts and history to accomplish divine purposes. Kairos, this, uh, this, uh, all these actions are on behalf of the gospel of Jesus Christ are significant for God's work. So the idea is, we're going to get into this in a little bit, perhaps in the Israel class that I'm going to lead beginning mid-January as we make our way to the Israel, the Holy Land trip, but um, there is a Christian Zionist movement where uh, the idea of premillennialism is that we have some agency to usher in the kingdom of God, and it's in, 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 it is by uh, regaining control over certain aspects. And my theology, and I think Reformed theology would tell you, is that humanity has no agency as to when this is going to happen. But we've all been invited to participate in the ushering in of that kingdom at the time in which God uh, brings it to be. But that there isn't anything that you can do to hasten it. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, let's look at the reformed emphasis of the reign of God. Oh, Hillary, please. Um, does Jesus talk much about the revelations or the end of the end of times when he's? Um... Yeah, uh, uh, Jesus. Uh, so revelation written after the death of Jesus. Uh, but yes, absolutely. I mean, there, there's um, and again, this kind of ties back to what I was saying earlier is. 
he's talking to them about the eternal reign of God or the kingdom of God. And each time that he's saying the kingdom of heaven, this, the, um, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, each time he's saying that, he's talking about this eternal reign. And they're interpreting it through the lens of the, the uh, nation building like the Roman Empire, like Persia, like Egypt. So they keep thinking about it in, uh, in, in human terms, and he's speaking uh, about something. So that's why you keep getting the disciples having this confusion about them, because, um, you know, and also why the, the scribes and the Pharisees keep getting pissed off, because they get what he's talking about. The scribes and the Pharisees, by and large, are understanding what he's talking about as the fulfillment of the prophecy of God's eternal reign. And here he is saying, like, I'm it. You know, this is this is this is the beginning. The scribes and the Pharisees are, are really pretty pissed off about it. But the disciples and the people of the Hebrew faith, they're not connecting with what the scribes and Pharisees, they're thinking about we're tired of living under the oppression of the Roman empire. We're tired of living under the oppression or living uh, as our ancestors did in exile in Persia and Assyria and the Netherlands. So they're just thinking about, man, it should just be great. I, I'd be, you know, you know, Bob on the corner of Jerusalem saying, I'd just be happy if we just had a Hebrew nation. You know, if we just had a land that's our own, I'd be okay with that. And Jesus is coming to liberate them to something that is beyond that. And, and they're not just, they're just not making that connection. I, I, Josh, one of the things that, that I didn't realize until recently, and I can't remember when it, when I realized, but the, the disciples, when they're going out and, you know, making disciples of us all, um, they are under the impression that Jesus' return is imminent. I mean, they thought that he was going to return shortly, like within their lifetime. Right. Right. I mean, so. Well, uh, yeah. Well, yes. Um, yeah. So after the ascension of Jesus, right? So after his death, after his resurrection, and he appeared to the disciples, and after his ascension, the disciples get it. Oh, he's not talking about nation building uh, as as the the kingdom of God's people here on earth. Oh, he they get it, and then they go out to uh, you know to to blow this thing up. And you're right. You see, especially with Paul and in uh, the Book of Acts, there is a lot of immediacy, as in like at any moment right yeah you know 30 days from now or tomorrow and uh all of christianity has had to deal the further away from the ascension into heaven the 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 further away we get from that chronologically yeah the the harder the reality is that to accept that oh it's not tomorrow it's not next month um but jesus also made it clear what did jesus say who, who led off with that? I think it was Ed. I asked Ed at the very beginning. Uh, when's he coming the back? The disciples asked him, when will these things occur? And he said, uh, there will be wars and talks of wars, but the end is not yet. And when you see peace and security, then the end will come. Yeah, that's the passage I read last weekend. I mean, yes, uh, but tying back to what you said earlier, who knows? The Father Only knows. the Father. Yeah. Only the Father. And so... Instead of keeping your eyes focused on trying to figure that out, don't waste time now on feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, welcoming the stranger, comforting the sick, and visiting the imprisoned. Uh, and, and part of what Paul's problem was is because he lived with some of that immediacy of the could be any moment. And so some of the challenges that we have in some of Paul's letter is uh, about divorce and slavery and, uh, and a variety of other things that Paul is saying, whatever your status is in life at this moment, don't go, go, don't, don't go worry about changing a thing because this isn't going to last all that much longer. 
chronologically. And that's the trouble that Paul's theology get, we have with, with Paul's theology all these many years later, because Paul's writing from a, this is going to be any minute, y'all. Uh, and, and, and that's what Paul's saying. Don't go rocking the boat. Don't go uh, uh, usurping the systems of oppression, because it's only going to be just a little while longer. So just hang in there because, you know, it could be tomorrow, could be next week, but real soon, this is what's going to happen. And so just accept your state in life where you are right now, because it's going to be a minute. Well, that was that, that imminent chronological time period, which Paul uh, was writing under, but, uh, uh, but as we know, having lived all this time later, uh, uh, no one knows but the Father. And I think the further we get away from that chronologically, the more that we have to live into the idea of, of God does not want us to miss the point of getting ready for that. And also, here's what I want you to do in the meantime. And that being very, very important. Uh, uh, reformed emphasis. Uh, I'm going to blaze through uh, some of this. Uh, in the Reformed tradition, uh, death is not the last word. That's a, as a, as a huge deal. Um, and and uh, in life and death, we belong to God. Hold on to the Alpha and the Omega, right? Hold on to the Alpha and the Omega. And in life and death, we belong to God. We are claimed by God. We are not thrown away. Uh, judgment. In the end, there will be judgment before Christ to give an account of thoughts, words, deeds, and action. I believe in a time of judgment that we will have that. And I think some people that, for many people, this is a source of anxiety and nervousness and a sense of uh, uh, inferiority and and the more that we look into the mirror and we have that, that we live with, the guilt, the shame, the dread, the shoulda, coulda, wouldas, because of the time when the judgment will come, um, the more that we think about that, the, 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 the more we're not thinking about a God of grace and mercy. And we believe in a God of grace and mercy that is so radically abundant and beyond our ability to conceive that it overpowers any of the shoulda, coulda, woulda, shame and guilt that we live with. Does that make sense? Yeah, so basically the people that are worrying about it probably don't have anything to worry about it. The people that have something to worry about aren't even considering it. That's very possible. Uh, that's very possible. And I go back to what I said in the salvation class, which is, and don't be surprised with who you find when you get to heaven. Just going to leave that one out there. Uh, resurrection of the body. God's gracious gift is a total and comprehensive resurrection, uh, just as with Jesus. Now, this for me is something that I have been wrestling with since 2000 and the fall of 2007. And I simply can say that uh, what McKim writes in this is our resurrection bodies will be ours in that in some mysterious way, our own selves will be raised from the dead, not another human being, but we are the ones who will be changed. Paul writes in Corinthians, listen, I will tell you a mystery. We, all, we will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. I have no idea how this works. And I simply believe that in some way, somehow, when we talk about the resurrection of the body, and that that is a promise for us that we will be resurrected in body somehow, some way, and some thing beyond my ability to conceive in my feeble brain. That's how it's going to be. Now, I have done an untold number of funerals and interments of people in coffins and people uh, uh, who've been cremated. 
I've done, I've poured the full volume of ashes of my father in the memorial garden. And I've been with families where we poured a third of the so-and-so's body here and a third of the so-and-so's body there and a third of the so-and-so's body there. I don't know how it's going to work, y'all. I, but you know what? I believe it will. And the more that I try to figure that out or spend time thinking about it, what am I doing? I'm not spending time trying to feed the hungry, get drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, comfort the sick, and visit the imprisoned. Chasing and the wind. Vanity and chasing the wind. You know what? There are things like that that faith tells me it's God's business, not mine. And I'm okay with that. I have peace. Hillary? So you're just saying, just go with that. Hell yeah. I'm saying, let's go with that. I just hope I come back as my 33-year-old self. <laughs> I was in pretty good shape back then. <laughs> no, wait a minute. No, wait a minute. I don't know. I couldn't tell you what year you actually are right now, but I know some pretty amazing 70-year-olds, John. So don't rule yourself out yet, buddy. If I get to be 70, that'll be pretty amazing. I'll take it. Let's not jinx in ourselves here, okay? Uh, eternal life. Eternal life means the removal of sin, no more sin. Eternal life means God's light is ultimate, no more death, no more darkness. Eternal life means God's presence is all in all. God is with us always. Eternal life means perfect oneness with others, fullness of community. Eternal life means a new heaven and a new earth. Creation will be liberated and renewed. I have no idea what this is going to look like. I'm not even going to pretend to tell you what this looks like. There's one spot on <laughs> earth in uh, Quebec, Canada, about an hour and a half north of Quebec City on the St. James River that I felt like was the most beautiful spot I've ever visited to in this world. But I think when I think of heaven, I think of that spot. And if that's what heaven ends up looking like for me, awesome. Uh, uh, I don't know what this is going to be like. And Jesus tells you, beware of any prophet who tries to tell you otherwise. But one thing we know for sure, no sin, no death. God's with us, the fullness of community and all of creation liberated and renewed. To God be the glory. Amen. 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 So final bit from McKim. He writes, in 1960s, a movement known as the Theology of Hope helped us See the shaping power of our expectations about the future for life in the present. Oh, that's what Josh is always talking about. What we believe about the future actually shapes us as much as or more than what we understand about the past. If we have no future to hope in, then there is no reason to do anything but despair in the present. To believe that we are ultimately moving toward the fulfilled reign of God, even as God's kingdom is taking shape in small ways in the present, those little glimpses, that belief brings us hope for the future and meaning in the here and the now. We are part of God's plans for history and beyond. Or, as I said it very simply in a sermon a few months ago, my theology is always bent to hope. And if my life, if our lives are being lived out as bent towards hope in the future, then that should be giving us some vision of the present. But if my life is ruled by the despair of the past, how does that distort the life I'm living now? Or if I am, as the writers of Ecclesiastes wrote, you know, seeking all this wealth, seeking all this power, seeking all this, uh, 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 you know, the now, vanity and chasing after the wind. I've missed it. I've missed out on all the things that God wants you to have in the finite amount of time that you, that you do have. Uh, because all of us have an end date. And the time between our birth and our end, you ever heard that song? The most important thing on your tombstone is that little dash in between the year of birth and the year of death. 
how are you going to live out your dash? That's what God wants you to do. That's what Jesus has been teaching us to do is to have a really good Ecclesiastes chapter two, have a really good dash, right? Because you know, it's kind of come to a close, baby. And you can't take it with you when you die. So that's it on the reign of God. So let me pull us into uh, some bigger picture thinking from August to present day. Uh, and take a breath because we finished. Uh, what's one thing you've learned over the course of all of this that has either stuck in your crawl or has been a pivotal moment, an aha moment? Uh, what's one thing that you've learned that has meant the most to you? And friends, I'd like to, and I'd like for all of us to share something because we've been traveling together for a long time now. So we're going to do this by mutual invitation. So uh, I'm going to call on Jim Henry to answer the question first. And then Jim, before you answer the question, if you will call on someone to go after you. Okay. Uh, I will call just as my screen shows. Right next to me is Kitty. Great. So, Kitty, so, I'll call on you next. Uh, it's not, this may not be an answer to your question, it's not one thing. What this course, what I have learned or what this course has meant to me is, as, as you've pointed out many times, I didn't grow up Presbyterian. And I have a lot to learn about that. But what this, what this course did for me is I kind of knew what we do as Presbyterians, but now I have a much better idea of why we do what we do. The, the history, the, uh, the reasoning behind the meaning of sacraments of high holy days that I knew, yeah, we do that and we didn't do this in the Baptist church, but we do this in the, but what this course has meant to me uh, more than anything, is just a better understanding of of why we do what we do. The the class I liked the best was on the Holy Spirit. Simply the whole discussion of three and one, one and three. How does it all mesh together? Is it one entity that splits itself off, or what are those entities? That was probably the class that uh, that meant most to me. But the whole course of the the why we do what we do. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Kitty, and if you'll invite someone before you answer. Yes, I'll uh, go to Hillary next. I think the thing that hit me the most was the community of the church. I think of my son on the lake saying, you know, this is his church. And yes, it's peaceful. And yes, he can see God's work. But it's nothing like having this group, this camaraderie, this fellowship, and learning more and more. Cool. I love that. Thank you. Uh, Hillary, if you'll uh, invite someone first. Unmute. Sorry, Jeannie. Um, for me, it's been, aside from learning about faith and um, being able to share it confidently, uh, share my faith with people and find other um, people who believe that um, maybe aren't willing to share it or who are curious and talking to them about it. Um, I think that for me has been one of the best things and inviting people and talking about reformed faith and understanding it and having a context for, you know, these discussions that I'm having with people. It's really been fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Jeannie? Uh, unmute. Unmute and then invite someone and then answer. Oh, still muted. Yes, there, you go. there you go. Oh, muted. Gloria. Okay. okay. Um, 
I really enjoy talking about the two sacraments that we have, um, the baptism and the, uh, the Eucharist, as I like to call it. I really enjoyed listening to different people in our group talk about like the views of Catholicism, the views of baptism or Baptist, Baptist or whatever ones that you said. I, I really enjoyed listening to that. And I like the image of our football field and how we, you know, kind of fit in there, even though we don't totally align. Um, but I do have to say, I think I'm going to miss Thursdays. Yes. <laughs> I have enjoyed this little group we have. It's a nice size. And um, I've gotten to know each of you a little bit. And I have to say, Josh, now that we've both mentioned today that we've enjoyed um, your teaching. So that just warms my heart, this, this whole experience. Thank you. Great. Um, that's me. Okay. Um, oh, knowing uh, Gloria, that Gloria, would you uh, pick somebody? I've got John, Diane, oh, Ed, uh, and Don left. Uh, Diane. Okay. Okay, so uh, I, I have enjoyed every class. It's been a blast. I mean, I've learned a lot. But uh, what I think um, is, is incredible is that we still, at this point in, in, the, in the ages of churches, there is a lot of communion with all different churches. There, there is a, a sharing of some of the theologies and I find that very enriching and like Christianity didn't come, it came out of Judaism, right? I mean, and, and Judaism came from all the other uh, religions that were around. So uh, I, I think that's wonderful and learned so much. And then the idea that we have to reform to adapt to the moment in history that we are. Otherwise, the, the scripture doesn't make sense today. So we need to have that in, in mind. I think that was very illuminating for me. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. And I enjoyed everybody and Pastor Josh. I always call you Pastor. <laughs> Much obliged. Uh, Diane, uh, we have Don, John, and Ed left. You pick someone and give your uh, answer. I'm going to pick Ed. And um, I have, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get to all the classes I listened to. A bunch of them recorded. So I'm so glad this has been recorded. Um, there's even been a, a couple classes I've kind of gone back and re-listened to some things. Um, it's kind of like each class I've done, I've always thought, Wow, this was the best one. Um, tonight, I'm kind of thinking, wow, this was the best talk. I just think it's stuff that we don't normally talk about in church and Christian education and Bible studies. And I've really enjoyed it. I feel like I've learned a lot. I know I have a lot more to learn. I think one of the things that made it so enjoyable is your passion for this subject has really come across Pastor Josh. And I feel like I've got to know you better as a pastor and a person. And and I've just so enjoyed your teaching of this class and, and the the heart you've put into it. And that carries through. And, and I think it's a lot of what I've really enjoyed about this class. Uh, I would love to delve into these topics further. Uh, and I love the, you know, the fellowship this group has had it would be nice if it could continue in some way in the future thank you diane and thank you that's very sweet i i especially appreciate that you said that in front of my mother <laughs> <laughs> you can be proud of your son he's, he's doing a good job here <laughs> all right and i've got don and john left okay i'll pick on don don you're I'm up sure. last buddy sure. I was pretty familiar with the uh, theology, and there was no big surprises in it for me, but I really appreciated the background you gave and the history of how we got here, a lot like Jim was describing. 
you know, it uh, really helps you understand why we believe these things and how the arguments went back and forth to uh, come to that conclusion. Cool. Thank you. And I kept every one of these sets of notes and plan to refer to them in the future. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right. John, then Don. And I, I, I'll go ahead. And, and Jeannie, you stole pretty much almost word for word what I was going to say. The, the two things that I enjoyed the most were about the baptism and the Lord's Supper. Uh, I will also miss Thursday until we start again in January. Um, but the, the thing that struck me the most about this class was the accessibility of it. Um, the I, I, I'm on a Christian ed commission. And so we try, one of the things we have to do is try and find classes, you know, to, to meet people where they're at, whether you are, you know, brand new on your, you know, discovering your faith, you know, this is your first Bible study thing like Hillary, or you're a brand new member to the church. And this may be your first one like Kitty, or you've been around forever, like Ed and Jim, you know, and everybody in between. And I think that Josh, you caught lightning in a, a bottle with this class. I mean, not only is it essential to who we are as, as Presbyterians, um, but uh, from what I've listened to everybody going around the horn, uh, everybody was able to get something out of it. Um, I appreciated the history part of it, um, as well as sort of laying that theological foundation to where we're at right now in the reformed faith, always reforming according to the word of God. Um, and, and I don't know if everybody knows, but you um, are currently working your way through a, towards a D-min, uh, a doctorate in, of ministry, uh, which is no small feat, you know, intellectually or with a full-time job. And sir, to put together a class like this, you have proven your mettle in that arena. So my hat's off to you. Thank you. And Don. Well, well, well John, buddy, uh, I hadn't told my mom yet. Uh, I was keeping that as a surprise. <laughs> so the Shit, cat's man. out of the bag, buddy. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> now I gotta have a call with mama. Uh, well, sorry about that. She didn't that. know, uh, but thanks, bud. Now, now I got to call her and tell her. Thanks. Uh, no, I, 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 yeah, I thank you. Uh, uh, one of the advices that I've always tried to live by with regard to uh, preaching is uh, when you're writing the sermon, you're writing, you're crafting it for someone who this is their, you know, one thousandth sermon they've ever heard in their life. You're also crafting it for the person who's hearing a sermon for the first time. And uh, I appreciate that feedback. And uh, though the history stuff has been fun, that's an element. I taught this class four years ago, and uh, that's something I've added to it. And um, I, I, I have just, Don, I'm taking your thunder, baby. Uh, uh, going through all of this again, this is probably my, personally, my fifth time to go through the book in 15 years. And, um, uh, uh, and while much of the stuff that was in the book is stuff that I've covered before, um, this particular time I tried to grab stuff outside of it. Um, and, and that's been enjoyable for me. Um, uh, Don. Um, several things I could say, Josh, and I'll, I'll just, I won't say several things. I'll, I'll say, uh, really just one. And that is that, um, I've enjoyed your delivery and um, uh, your passion for the subject, but I've also really appreciated your willingness to share how you feel about some of the things. Uh, and I'm, I specifically recall when you talked about the Trinity and how that I don't remember specifically what your words were, but the 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 sense that I came away with is okay. This is not essential to everything in. And Josh's faith, and, and you know, Josh isn't saying he has doubts about anything, but he's also saying that if I do, it's okay, and uh, mm -hmm. I can even have doubts about my doubts. And I, it felt, it felt pretty good getting. Yeah. Uh, I remember, I remember starting that one off, Don, by saying that this is the most complicated, the 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 one that I struggle with the most. I remember leading off that day, uh, and that causes me the most amount of agita. 
Um, and, and, and so I appreciate you referring back to that. Um, uh, thank you, Don. Were you going to add any more? Did I cut you off? No, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm done. Thank you. And I turn the floor over to Josh. You haven't spoken. It, it's me. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I think I said what I said, which is, you know, I've appreciated adding in the, the stuff from outside the book. Um, uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed, uh, I always enjoy and look forward to adding the laboratories in, uh, the place where we get to, to, to try some stuff out and to read some things and to, to put some things into practice. Um, I know that um, there's, a, there's a separate thing that has nothing to do with this class, that there's some new terminology and some new theories that I've learned over the last six, seven months that uh, because I have brought that terminology and, and theories into my brain, I've been seeing the world through that terminology. So uh, what my hope would be for y'all is that as we've been going through this, that some of what we've been doing, you've been able to see and interpret, uh, whether it's television, whether it's what Josh is say, saying on Sunday mornings, or it's in a prayer or an aha with the scripture passage. Um, and I find that to be real exciting. And uh, that we never, again, we never arrive to a point in the development of our faith where we're done. You know, this is, this is not a, you know, a, a thing where you can ever know it all. And uh, it only that uh, this is something that age, Christian education is something that ages well with time. And certainly the more that you continue to invest into it. Um, and so my encouragement to you would be to continue doing that. Um, a, a, a few other uh, parting thoughts, just a, a few things. One, uh, uh, as John mentioned, he is our elder for adult Christian education. So I do want to encourage you to complete the evaluations. They, uh, the Christian Ed Commission Committee, they do read all of the evaluations from all the classes we do. That does give uh, them some direction. I don't think I ever intended that a Thursday night from seven to nine is a class that I ever thought would be enjoyable. Uh, and yet uh, I'm now looking forward to it. So the, the class I'm teaching beginning mid January and it'll go through the end of February is a six week class on the Holy land. And it's predominantly uh, open and invited for the folks who are going on the trip, but I'm gonna craft it in such a way that if you're not going on the trip, you still would get a lot out of it. And I think it's important. Um, so if that's something of interest to you, we're gonna be talking about uh, Islam, Judaism, the politics of Israel, Palestine, um, and, and some of the sites and locations, et cetera. So um, I, I hope that would be of interest to you. Uh, what uh, John and I have not talked about this time slot going forward, nor have we talked about our 11 o'clock time slot on Sunday mornings going forward. So we're going to take a little bit of a pause uh, between now and January, but um, uh, I look forward to having uh, offerings for y'all uh, that we can promote here shortly. So if you have thoughts about what you would like, put those in the evaluations. Uh, there's this class that I've done on Thursday night is not the class I intended to do on Thursday night this fall. Um, I only did this because Joel left and it's one that I knew that I could do and do well. The class that I was going to do this fall was one I was going to write from scratch and, uh, and it was going to be on Christianity in America from the colonial time period to present day. And that's a, that's a thing that's still, that gets me really excited. And I, it's a history class, a little bit more than a theology class, which I think would be a lot of fun. Uh, but I just have to have more time to write it than I've been allocated since Joel left. Um, so, but if you have other thoughts, topics or engagements, uh, things that, you know, uh, you'd like to do, uh, please, you know, put that in the evaluations and I'd be happy to, for us to continue exploring that John and I will will go through those and and think about you know what's in the in the rubric of things that we can examine you know where are we hitting where are we missing where could we be stronger 
And, um, and it may be that um, y'all have a topic that it might just be best for me to contract uh, a special guest speaker to come and facilitate this time on Thursday nights, especially if we're going to do it via Zoom. And um, I have thoroughly enjoyed the accessibility. I, I'll never forget the, the evening where Hillary was, I don't know, at an airport. John was at an airport. Kitty's in Arizona. You know, everybody was four sheets to the wind. Well, wait, wait, wait. That's the wrong expression. <laughs> the four corners of the earth. Uh, and yet here we all were, right? I mean, Hillary's walking her phone to the now, ladies and gentlemen, it's that's your captain speaking. It's time to turn on your seatbelts. Um, uh, right. So uh I think this is really cool and it makes it more accessible. Um, and I'm cool with that. So uh again, it's uh thank you for all of it. I've really loved getting to know you all better um and, and hearing some of your feedback, especially from the varied uh, backgrounds that we have, some folks who've been lifelong Presbyterians, some Catholics, some Baptists, some, you know, wherever I am, whatever that may be, uh, uh, that has been really enjoyable. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned about the football field because, um, uh, again, I think that helps me figure out that it's a big, there are things out of bounds, but it's a big field uh, and that's okay. So, all right. Any other thoughts? Yeah, if if I could make a recommendation, I know you're going to ask for somebody to do the closing prayer, I but will. a lot of times in, in different venues, what we do is uh, everybody comes off mute and we all say the prayer together. I would offer that up as an option tonight. Our Got last it. class. Got it. Uh, uh, we'll all do the closing prayer together off mute, and it's going to sound like uh, Pentecost Sunday when <laughs> everybody begins to understand each other. So we're going to be out of sync. It's going to sound a little weird and yet it's incredibly spiritual and powerful at the same time. So uh, uh, come off mute and uh, let us do the closing prayer together. Let us pray. Holy one, enthralled in your glory over all, all creation, creation, you are you a shepherd to the lost and the least. In the least. Teach us to Teach see, us see your face among the poor, poor. Feeding, feeding the hungry, hungry. Giving, giving drink to the thirsty, thirsty. welcoming the stranger, stranger. Clothing the naked, and visiting, and visiting those sick who are or sick or in prison. prison. So that, so that we may share in your, in your eternal, eternal realm, realm prepared for, for the foundation of the world, of the world. through Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, who is, who is coming, coming in me, to reign in justice, justice and compassion, compassion and love. And love. Amen. 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 All right. Let me.